Welcome to the August 13th Jalen Zones production user call. We have Dan, Carlo, Jan, Rod, and myself, Michael, and we have a transgender topic, if I spelled that, said that right. Uh, what GitHub alternatives are there in 2024 that are meaningful? There is Gitia, there is GOGS, which is a fork, there is GitLab, but also came up uh, Forgio, is that how I pronounce that? And shithub.us, which has some lovely artwork. Let's get that up there. Here we go. Shithub, the fragrant Git host. Um, has anyone present used these? I have a code block account. It works mostly like GitHub. Um, or it's a slightly beefed up Gitty. And Forgio is just a fork. And was that Codeberg? Oh, oh well. uh, what's the URL? Oh, here we go. Thank you for posting that copy. Um, okay, I see. As long as you stay within the free tiers, you can just mirror your project to multiple sources. And then if one changes the terms of con and conditions, uh, you can just close your account there. Cool. Okay, thank you. And Potentially a future topic, Carlo mentioned barrier, a KVM over IP solution that uh, can have surprising uh, keyboard sharing surprises, but otherwise it looks kind of cool. And how many OSs are you using that on, if I may? Uh, I'm using it okay. uh, at the moment uh, on my FreeBSD machine as a server, and uh, my Linux laptop is a client, and I use a uh, mouse and keyboard uh, cool. from my uh, free VZ machine, but copy paste uh, buffer can sometimes be a bit weird. I pasted uh, like normal text and it uh, pasted it in as some Chinese characters. Usually, you can fix that by pasting it into a terminal or a browser, uh, and then into some other application, mm -hmm. and it fixes itself. Cool. Yeah, I find myself stripping like formatting all the time. Okay. So to the point, Carlo, you have been doing some experiments with uh, jail shutdown times and you've pasted some results. What can you tell us about these? Yeah, so last week I asked uh, if anyone knew why jail destruction was uh, so slow. And uh, you somebody mentioned that it could be uh, something due to a bunch of uh, shell processes or the exec or something, and I should detrace it. I haven't had time uh, to test it uh, properly, but I just uh, used a parallel, a GNU parallel uh, utility to run to run uh, 100 uh, jail creations uh, uh, in parallel, and then jail destruction. And uh, here are some timings. And as you can see, if I just create jails uh, with persist flag and uh, destroy them, it's uh, almost the same, uh, the timing. Uh, it's uh, 254 uh, milliseconds. And, and uh, when I'm creating VNet jails, it's a bit slower. It could be just uh, noise from this test. I only ran it a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, jail destruction uh, of VNet jails is uh, notice noticeably slower. Indeed. I can usually see one by one uh, uh, of them uh, dis disappearing uh, when I run JLS. Uh, a few times, and it's 23 seconds for uh, 100 jails. Hmm. So yeah, I think uh, uh, a friend of mine mentioned it was uh, something weird happened uh, in FreeBSD 12, I think, and then it became suddenly a lot slower than it was before. But I'm not sure I I've, I wasn't using FreeBSD back then. Hmm. So. Just a suspicion, but that could be the epoch-based garbage collection you're observing there. Basically, you're allowed to hold your references for a while without revalidating them. That means that your the system isn't free to completely release this this network stack, while it could still have pointers uh -huh. without big pointers to that. So basically, you're paying the price at destruction time for fast startup and runtime. Uh huh. So, so that you don't have to acquire a mutex every time you use some resource. But that was, I'm guessing, a, an epoch clock on uh, VNet then, 
because it's the only yeah, thing that, that changes. That here. was between 12 and 13 bit reduction of epoch to the network stack, I think. Uh huh. And yeah. Rod, if you're able, any theories on that one? That was 12 and 13. Question mark. Okay, well, uh, can we think of tests that Carlo can run to validate that, be it specific D-trace or trust or otherwise? Cool, well, keep us posted and hopefully Jamie might have some insights. Moving on, uh, vector packet processing has landed in FreeBSD, is in ports as of just the other day. And uh, that said, uh, who is our resident expert who knows more than nothing and I know nothing about it? So Jan, you mentioned you know a few things. And Rodney so, might have some uh, thoughts. VPP is a user space bridging and routing engine, if you want to think of it like that. So uh, its goal is to minimize context switches and data copies and can uh, easily beat your normal Linux or FreeBSD network stack by a factor of 10 to 100 and sometimes 1,000 when it comes to packets per second throughput. Um, the downside, of course, is of course that it's not easily usable as your normal BSD socket API network stack, but it's mostly around a packet forwarding engine written in software. Yeah. And okay. for the longest time, it was Linux only. And now the FreeBSD Foundation uh, paid, among others, I think, uh, Tom Jones to port it to FreeBSD. And now the port has landed to the port tree. It's probably still in a slightly rough shape. Uh, from his blog post you have already linked in the document. Hmm. Um, no, not that. Let's just. I know that's that's message. a commit, but let's see if he's coming. So, co-authored by Joseph. Okay, yeah. and there's the actual goodies. So wow. this means that now you can uh, either use uh, just like on Linux DPDK or for supported Nix, which is a complete user space driver for uh, the. PCIe virtual functions you would normally pass through to virtual machines. Mm -hmm. Or you can use NetMap, which uh, allows the driver to hand off batches of packets. Uh, sorry, in that terminology, it would be vectors of packets um, to um, user space in pre allocated buffers. And then the rest is done by reference. And you avoid ever looking at the payload of the packets. So yeah. Is that um, equally or of zero interest or what interest to jails and virtual machines? Mm. It could potentially be a very fast uh, bridge, but at uh, the moment where you have to get the packets back into the host or into the jail, you lose part of the advantage. The bigger point of interest is to use it as a flexible bridge for our Beehive. So that would require a smartish backend, but they already have that uh, in VPP for a QEMO. So FreeBSD's Beehive would have to hook into that, and then we would have the yeah, this bridge to run at multiple tens of gigabits. Okay, cool. Uh, or tens of millions of packets per second. Mm -hmm. uh, what we still need is in Beehive, the smarts to actually expose the multi-queue uh, behavior and the uh, offloading. Mm. But then you don't have to go through a tap into a bridge and then out of the bridge into the real interface. So there's a potential for lots of... Um, performance gains even for the simple bridge use case, but the even more uh, impressive performance gains will be seen if you then wanted to implement some kind of overlay on Nix, which support that. 
for example, a VXLAN overlay with a, some kind of BGP-based signaling. Of course, the control plane needs to be ported as well, but now we have a data plane. Okay. Uh, Rodney, if you're we available. We have had that with a veil, but nobody used it. No one used the veil. Okay. And one of the results of his work is that uh, they found and fixed two bugs in NetMap generic. So NetMap support uh, emulated for drivers which do not have native NetMap support, mostly uh, pseudo interfaces like ePair. So that explains why uh, ePair and uh, NetMap combined generated kernel panics because of a double free. Hmm. Cool. Michael, did you, I heard my name. Yeah, I did. I, is VPP on your radar? Have you bumped into yeah. that in your work? Yeah. It's you know, on my radar. I have people that are specifically interested in it in the routing community. Yep. Um, it stands for vectorized packet processing, as you noted there and stuff. And, and basically, it's a it's a way to process a boatload of packets all at once. Hmm. So you're watching this space? I am intermediately watching this space for other interested parties in the FRR community and in the routing community. Thank you for volunteering to keep us uh, posted as you discover really cool things about it. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, keep us posted as uh, you more, find more, more than likely what I'm going to hear about is breakage in it. Kind of. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Things that don't work the same way as they work on Linux is what I'm going to hear about. Ah, uh, yeah. Watching for breakage. That is a reasonable task. Okay. Uh, somewhat uh, related, but not directly. Yes, please. Uh, do you know uh, if there is uh, still anybody working on uh, uh, MPLS support in FreeBSD? There was like uh, a project... Uh, almost 10 years ago and uh, it stopped then somebody else uh, on google summer of code i think uh, asked uh, to help uh, with that i don't know if uh, anybody did any progress on that or, it, or if it was just uh, an idea the, the the latest that i've heard on mpls on freebsd was there was yet another student that was going to do it in summer google summer of code last year i don't know whatever happened with it no at, at, okay. at one point i had a rather large um, South Africa telco on the hook to pay to get it done, and that's gone now. So I don't know if we'll ever get MPLS. Oh. But my question would be, does it really make sense to spend the effort today to uh, implement MPLS, given that the industry is quickly moving off of MPLS for most things? I don't know that that's true. MPLS is excruciatingly prevalent in the telco community. Yeah. Yes. It's, it, once you have it, it's hard to uh, eradicate. Right. But... What are they switching to? Just like uh, normal uh, IP routing? Um, Native Ethernet. Summer. So Ethernet with enough capacity that you don't have to have the same kind of traffic engineering because it's just the MTU hasn't grown, the throughput has grown, light speed stays the same. So you can just overcommit a bit and it's cheaper mm -hmm. and gets you the same uh, tail latency up to several nines. And the other option is uh, to then use uh, other overlay networks based on IP without having an other unfamiliar protocol in between with its own addressing system, its own forwarding rules and so on. Because these days it's, you have IP uh, longest path prefix in ASIC. And so the incentive to use uh, label switching has gone down because you you can just buy hardware which can do IP forwarding and even encapsulation and de-encapsulation at line rates so that you can do things like the XLAN or GIE up to your uh, top of rack switch. And it's just a uh, Novalay network with OSPF or BGP. 
Right. But that makes you sense. have to learn fewer tech stacks. Hmm. And also that you can buy IP transport and don't have to buy layer two transport because MPLS, unless you encapsulate it inside of something like GAE, runs on top of Ethernet or potentially even older obscure um, layer two protocols. I don't know if anyone is still running it over things like PDH, SDH. I wouldn't call the past ISPs too. Cool. The, the other huge installation of MPLS is the financial industry, extensively used for private networks between facilities. But is it truly exposed to them or are they paying for a bridged They're running interface? MPLS and they know what it is and they know how to use it. Okay, so they're running it themselves in the US, they're not buying it as a service. They're buying L2 MPLS from the telcos. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess also watch this space. It's a shame those projects have come and gone and come and gone. So that said, uh, welcome, Michelangelo. Do you want to do an introduction? No pressure. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Hello there. I'm Michelangelo Mori. I am a software developer in the cybersecurity industry. And I just found interesting the Jails Weekly call, and I thought I could join. You That's are it. absolutely welcome to join. Uh, do listen in. Feel free to catch some previous uh, meetings. They're all on YouTube. And the absolute secret is, is that this document, which I'll paste, is wide open. You can put your topic there. And if the topic's interesting, we'll probably address it, even if you're not there. And then you just simply sit back and listen to the recording. So. Thank you. Uh, of course, welcome and feel free to jump in with questions as things come up. Uh, security developer, three developer. Cool, welcome. So, uh, Jan, you wanted to talk about dying jail. So, what is this review? And you found that due to the resurrection of the. Okay, so go ahead. What's so going on here? You have an update. When you uh, destroy a jail, it cannot be immediately destroyed because there are things which still reference the jail and the kernel. For example, if you have a VNet that references its jail and then the VNet has interfaces and so on, so you can't immediately destroy it, but the user would like a quick response and doesn't want to wait until the last TCP connection and so on has been shut down. The the fin2 state times out and so on. So uh, normally the jail, when you shut it down, stays for a few seconds in the state called dying where resources are freed up and only when the last reference to the jail is dropped does the jail truly get destroyed. And it used to be a, a possible to bring back a dying jail in an act of necromancy and uh, start it up again. Uh, but this caused issues. So uh, Jamie implemented the features to instead renumber the dying jail's jail ID and free up the jail ID for immediate reuse this way. And so you can bring it back, but it feels instead as if the jail is already gone and you can create a new one. And I stumbled over that commit and just wondered what that does for the uh, out of tree dev CTL uh, jail event uh, came out. If now there's a operation, it doesn't trace or if there are other issues um, with this new semantic on the way to uh, making it impossible to bring back a dying jail. Is the goal of the quick to response ask about this, or but the resurrection? Uh, the potentially unintended 
consequences of renumbering the dying jail. Okay. For example, what happens when you use the GID in the jail coma and uh, release hook or something? And I just wanted to ask if no. this has all been gained out uh, and if there are regression tests in place or if this is, all of this is only in 15 current, so it's not going to become a problem tomorrow. Right. I guess, uh, are you equipped to test the behavior in 15 current? Yes. I'm building it, but my lab machine where I want to run it, bare metal is just a port core, so it takes a while. I personally love the weekly snapshots if you want some FreeBSD 15 goodness with very little effort. Just okay. saying. Okay. I did uh, that, and then I wanted the sources for it and compiled it myself. So that cool. it's hey. all consistent. It's remarkable that you get all those options. So let's see, Antrenig is not around for his jailer update. Um, Carlo, do you have a different bug? Yeah, this one's uh, not, re okay. not related to the thing above. So That's I noticed right. uh, in a program I was working, I never encountered this before, but I, uh, I when I, Inside my program, I effectively use jail set to create a persistent uh, jail. And after it does some things, it tries to attach to it. And that fails. Uh, and it says it's because of permissions. Hmm. And uh, the manual page indicates nothing to us as to what it could be. Uh, according to man page, it should work. I have no idea why it, it is failing. Um, uh, so if you have the, any idea. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, go ahead. Have an idea. So the reasons why I encounter this is either you have dropped privileges and you're no longer root. Because, uh, uh, no, it's it's not. Uh, when I use uh, get UID, it's zero and get UID and get uh, group ID and effect, uh, effective group ID, oh. it's all zero. The other issue is that you're not allowed to bring a directory file descriptor into a jail during jail attack. Oh. So if your process has any directory file descriptor, it could use those to bypass the jail path restriction to its jail directory. Right. And so that the kernel sense. does not allow you to bring that in because otherwise you could use uh, open ad or even more uh, dangerous f change dir to change your working directory to outside of your jail root. Okay, um, that makes sense. I, I actually do hold a directory file descriptor. I never- So uh, you have uh, to uh, fork, close that and yeah. try again. Okay, uh, so yeah, uh, that should probably be documented in the man page. Uh, uh, it's, it's documented somewhere, but it's not in a place where you find it unless you know to look for it. Yeah, I would expect that to be in jail attach uh, under uh, eparam, which, which is uh, the error number uh, I'm getting. So there was no mention of anything like this. So yeah, I should probably file a bug or something, uh, or actually create a patch and then file. A, yeah, first uh, verify the behavior, but yeah, totally documentation. Yeah. Is friend. Uh, thank you, Jan. Well. Uh, skipping this topic, uh, anything else this week, or have we solved enough mysteries in one go? So, yes, Jan. I've submitted a bug report, even if it's not maybe the perfect form, I should maybe turn it into a review for uh, the feature I mentioned last week, that is to uh, filter the output uh, of jail-e by a, a list of jails. So it's just waiting for someone to commit it. And last night I implemented um, the ability for the jail command when it finds an executable configuration file 
to just execute the configuration file as a child process and consume its standard output as a jail.conf snippet. Um, if the command exits with anything but zero, that's also an error. So that you can have dynamic parts in your jail.conf, for example, a Postgres database query or something could become part of the output, could be performed or an LDAP query, whatever, pick your poison. Um, and you turn that into jail.conf syntax. Is that different from the other use cases? Yes. Okay. Those are Give two different commits. Give a... um, no, for the second part, not yet. Okay. I uh, didn't get around to uh, doing that. Cool. Then I've put the, P the PR in there. Um, have you seen any movement on it? Or let's take a peek. No, um, I haven't. And is there a jail group to tag, or did you ta tag Jamie? Out of I tagged Jamie directly because okay. I mentioned to him. Do, 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 do. I ripped out a bunch of unnecessary code out of the second feature. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, the one idea from last week was to make this a review rather than PR. Is that yes? Uh, and e no time. E no time. Got it. Uh, please review. I uh, need to make it a review. So now this inanimate object of a agenda is now shaming you into doing that. Okay. Uh, one update. I just yeah. tested the, the idea Jan uh, gave me, and uh, it it was because I was holding a file script up to a directory. Uh, so thank you, Jan. <laughs> you solved the mystery. Love it. I lost a few hours as well to that. Uh, and I suppose it's my duty to say you are cordially invited to the upcoming Open ZFS User and Developer Summit in Portland, Oregon. That will be October 26th, I believe, the Saturday through Tuesday. Just saying. Uh, note the... Uh, Summit. Okay, other topics, or shall we call it at, say, 1740 UTC? Going once, going twice. Who wants the honors? Like and subscribe. Thank you, everyone. I'll be around in a few minutes and have a great week.